Royal Roads University acknowledges that the campus is on the lands of the Kosapson and Lequingan ancestors and family. With gratitude, we live, work, and learn. Here, where the past, present, and future of the indigenous and non indigenous students, faculty, and staff come together. My name is Sarvi Sharma, and I'm currently pursuing my master's in intercultural and international communication. This session is about the value of professionalization in strategic communication. In an era of eroding trust in media and government, how do communication professionals avoid losing credibility in time of crisis? The panelists will be discussing this topic and the session will be approximately 45 minutes long and we will try to use the last 15 minutes for q and that you will be posting during the session. I will be on and off camera gathering all the questions with the help of a backstage conference team. So please do post all your questions in the chat section. Now I would like to introduce the moderator of this panel discussion, Andy Watson. With over a decade of strategic communications experience and a decade before that as a journalist, Andy is a collaborator and connector looking to help professionals in the industry to grow and develop. Andy is a graduate of the MA in Professional Communication program from Royal Roads and is a member of the School of Communication and Cultures Advisory Board. He's also a not-for-profit consultant and serves as the chair of officiating for Lacrosse British Columbia. Over to you, Andy. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction and, and thanks to Royal Roads University for coordinating uh, today's very important conference, which obviously extends into tomorrow as well. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge that I'm moderating today from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. And I'm very grateful to be here today and sharing in the spirit of contributing to our communities and society through professional practice. So thank you and I raise my hands to all of you. Uh, it's been a great day uh, so far for those that have been able to take part in some of the earlier sessions. Uh, we heard from Dr. Jagress Hodson. Uh, we just heard from Robert Remington uh, on his thought provoking presentation on ethics in the profession. Uh, but both of them spoke to pieces I think that really set, set us up nicely for this concluding uh, discussion and, and panel on um, you know, what we need to consider I think as communications professionals uh, in this era of uh, misinformation, disinformation, how we can get trust um, back into our profession and some of the tactics that we can take and, and things that we can do to try and help us. And I am really, really, um, you know, encouraged by uh, the great discussions I'm, I'm hearing and certainly the panel that we have here today. Um, we'll take a look at ethics and doing what's right, perhaps not necessarily what's popular in strategic communications and how we can professionalize in our practice. Uh, so I'm going to introduce um, each of the speakers, just give you a little bit of information on them, and then I'm going to have them take over and, and talk a little bit about what they do and, and, and pose a question to each of them. Uh, three experts today. The first, uh, and, and joining us all the way from New Zealand, we have Fiona Cassidy, um, who and, and all three of these speakers have their APR, which is something we'll talk about throughout the session. Uh, Fiona is with the Public Relations Institute of New Zealand as the chairperson there. And with over 25 years in communications and public relations experience, Fiona is recognized as one of New Zealand's senior communications professionals. She's worked nationally and internationally, both in-house and as a consultant. Uh, she's held every senior management appointment as a PR professional and has uh, also been at the GM level. Um, first chairperson of the PR Institute of New Zealand a life member there. She's also actively involved in the Community Communications Collective, which provides volunteer services for not-for-profit agencies. She holds a number of director and board appointments on business, government, and not-for-profit organizations, and was appointed to the Global Alliance of PR and Management Board in 2015, becoming an executive officer in July of 2019. So welcome, Fiona. Kim Blanchett, uh, Senior Vice President and General Manager for Western Canada and the National Lead for Indigenous Engagement in Communications with Argyle Communications. Uh, she's also a CPRS National Board member uh, and a member of the CPRS College of Fellows. A chartered and accredited comms professional, Kim's talents run the entire PR gamut. She has more than 25 years experience, still loving every day at work. Uh, working with the national team at Argyle, Kim helps organizations to engage, communicate, and lead with confidence. She's a proud past president of the CPRS Society uh, and a chair of the CPRS Task Force on Ethical Public Relations um, and a member of the national board. And, and just last week, I actually heard uh, Kim deliver a session called Trust Me, I'm 
I'm in PR as part of Ethics Month with the Global Alliance for Public Relations and Communication Management. So welcome, Kim. And last but not least, Cam McAlpine, uh, Principal with Ernst Cliff Strategies and the current CPRS National President. Cam uh, is a National Strategic Communications Advisor, uh, has been in government and public relations, and obviously uh, really brings a lot of credibility to the practice. He's currently uh, doing an outstanding job helping to lead the CPRS National Chapter and supporting PR professionals across the country. He's been a member of CPRS's Board of Directors since 2017. And, uh, and again, uh, like the other two panelists, brings a lot of experience and, 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 and guidance that we can provide. So thanks to each of you for making time to join us today. Um, just to set the stage, uh, in an era of eroding trust in media and government, as we heard off the top, we want to talk about how, how as communications professionals, we can help uh, to avoid losing credibility in a time of crisis, and what we can do to take steps in our uh, professional practice today. Um, our panel of professional communicators will share their thoughts on challenges that we're faced with, on how ethical frameworks and professional associations can help us both optically and with collaborative and networking techniques to help address these, is these issues. Uh, part of our chat will include an introduction to professional associations like CPRS, and it will also look into uh, what other tools may exist out there that we can dig into today to help us navigate these difficult questions. So. Uh, as was mentioned off the top, please throw uh, add your questions in the chat um, and we'll take the moderated questions later in the presentation. Um, for now though, uh, I'd like to um, stop talking and turn it over to the experts in this area. Um, and first ask them to give a brief introduction of themselves and I'll start with Fiona and then ask each member if they can consider the question on how professionalization and ethical PR can help to fight back against fake news misinformation and disinformation. So Fiona, I'll start with you and then we'll go to Kim and Cam. So Fiona, over to you. My name's Fiona Cassidy. Just did a quick little introduction as I am Māori, I am Indigenous to recognise first the people's land that we are on today and also to all of you who have joined us. Um, as you've heard, I've been around a little while now and more importantly, um, the reason I continue to be at a governance level is because what underpins us as professionals is actually the code of ethics. Now, I know that in all of our studies, we hear about it and what does it mean? But fundamentally, to be a profession, we need a code of ethics. So the question that has been posed is, what is professionalism? And as I said, the code of ethics actually underpins that. Now, whether or not you are with the Public Relations Institute of New Zealand or with your own Canadian um, association, we all sign up as professionals to join. And in doing that, here in New Zealand, what we say is that the values that underpin us as practitioners is the right to advocacy, the right to honesty, the right to our expertise, that we must be independent and we must be loyal and fair. To be successful in this profession, you must actually ensure that you do adhere to those code of ethics. And if you don't, then actually, yes, there are people who do not that is not what we see as professional, whether it be in your daily work as a PR practitioner, whether it be if you were providing uh, information to clients, everything is built on honesty, fairness, open, openness and transparency, which brings me to the second part of the question that we asked. How can ethical PR fight back against fake news, misinformation and disinformation? We're not actually in a fight, ladies and gentlemen. What we are is in a position where we have to do our job well for our clients based on the ability to be honest and transparent. We know that the world has changed and has been continually changing since the internet became something to be grappled with and that there will always be those who look for alternative views. 
my challenge to you as both students in PR and those who are joining as professionals is ensure that the code of ethics underpins all the work that you do. Because in doing that, in the world that you're in, in the world that you influence, that is where you can continue to ensure there is advocacy, honesty, and transparency. I look forward to hearing to the um, to our other panelists and thanks so much for letting me to come to British Columbia today. Thanks so much, Fiona. Kim, over to you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so glad to be here today. I'd like to start by acknowledging I am here in Calgary today, so in the traditional territories of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, including the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, the Tsitsina Nation, the Stony Nakoda, and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Um, you know, I spent most of my career in the public service, only uh, joined agency a few years ago. So I worked with both the federal and provincial governments and most recently before joining the Argyle team with the Alberta Energy Regulator. You know, I've always been passionate about CPRS and belonging to professional organization. I didn't study PR in school, so I kind of fell through, fell into it through politics. And so the APR was really important to me. It was a sign I had what it takes, that despite not studying it, I practiced the profession based in research, theory, and professional standards that were really recognized worldwide. And for me, ethics became very, very real before I left the Albert Energy Regulator. Uh, there was a very public corruption scandal, one that was subject to three reviews by the Ethics Commissioner, the Public Interest Commissioner, and the Auditor General of Alberta. Long story short, but it boiled down to the CEO and several executives, including my boss, using the regulator's resources to support their own consulting firm. So I was named in the report because I was vocal in standing up for ethics and I was so vocal uh, and at one point I refused to lie to a reporter, which I was ordered to do, uh, and as a result I was suspected as the whistleblower. I wasn't, but only because I didn't have evidence. I just had a hunch of what was going on. The reason I raise this is because I really believe if I wasn't a member of the CPRS, if I didn't take time to become a student of ethical PR, to look at case studies, to discuss ethical issues, to participate in events like this, I don't know I would have been as firm as I was faced with that kind of authority and power. I knew I had a community behind me. I knew I had a code of professional standards to lean on, and that really gave me strength. So when it comes to the role that PR can play in correcting misinformation and addressing disinformation, and I do believe there's a distinction, um, in the PR perception study that we conducted with both PR professionals and Canadians, it was really clear that PR professionals are expected to help the public sort through the quagmire and find out what to trust. We'll dive into it a bit later, but I was really surprised to see the public support, not just for a professional association and the role it plays, but for accreditation. 83% of Canadians believe the CPRS has a role to play in advocating for ethical PR. 82% of Canadians feel we should be enforcing ethical violations. 81% of the public trust APR designated professionals, and 67% believe organizations should only hire APRs. I think that really points to it as a profession. There's an expectation that we are advocates for our audiences and we adhere to those professional standards and ethics and the designations that demonstrate that commitment. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today and I'll punt it over to Cam. Thanks, Kim. Kia ora, Fiona. Nice to see you. Um, I am uh, speaking to you today, well, I'm, I'm from Kelowna, BC, which is the traditional territory of the Sulex, Okanagan Sulex, but I'm coming to you today from uh, Vancouver, our, uh, our office in Vancouver, which is the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations, uh, and I'm privileged to be here today. Thank you all for having me, Andy, appreciate the invitation. Um, so I, I entered into PR, I think, in a different way than both Fiona and Kim, but probably in a similar way to a lot of people uh, on the call today. Um, I started my career in journalism and, like a lot of people, found my way by accident into, into communications and PR. Um, Andy's smiling because uh, we were having a chat earlier about uh, journalists and PR professionals. Um, you know, I think that journalists, any journalist that finds their way into PR uh, comes with a, with a natural cynicism about the job. And it's, it sometimes takes some time to uh, actually come to terms with the fact that this is what I'm doing for a living now. Um, but uh, I, I wrote a piece for our uh, 
uh, CPRS's bi-weekly newsletter today um, about this subject. And uh, it's, it's really about, you know, moving from the concept of what we do being a job uh, and then moving into conceiving of what we do as potentially actually being a career, something that we can make a, make a living at for a long period of time. And then the, what, I, what I would depict is the third level uh, of, of any career is professionalization. So actually not just having a job, not just having a career, but being a professional. Um, the distinction for me really is about a professional standard and ethical framework. Kim and Fiona have both really outlined that, that really well. Um, <clears throat> when, I, when I think about, so Andy, your question about what can we do to fight back against fake news, misinformation, and disinformation, I, just a side note, I, I don't think fake news is, is the, the right term. Uh, yes, CPRS has a fake news primer on our website. Uh, we've talked about changing the name. Um, unfortunately, I, I think it's a symbol of today that if you were to use the term fake news, uh, it would mean different things for probably three out of every four people. Uh, what I think is fake news is different than what Donald Trump thinks is fake news, for example. Um, but uh, my, my point being that um, we do want to fight against misinformation and disinformation. Kim, I think you mentioned there's a difference. There is a difference. Misinformation, I can tell you something that's untrue and not realize it. Disinformation is, I, I can tell you something that I know is untrue, but I'm going to tell it to you anyways. Um, one, one, just one final point. Kim mentioned the perception survey that CPRS did. And... Um, now, Kim, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I did review it in, in advance. And um, the interesting thing to me uh, was the flip side of what you were talking about. Was the, so the public has this perception that PR professionals, uh, the, the APR accreditation um, are extremely important, that we should have an, an ethical framework, a, a code of professional standards. Um, the flip side of that was interesting to me, which is that uh, public relations professionals don't value the APR as highly as uh, as non-professionals, as the general public. I think the number, Kim, was about 33% value the APR, which was astounding to me because, well, I have an APR and I, and I understand the value of it. Um, it is one of the underpinnings of an ethical practice and an ethical profession. So I, I think we're going to talk more about that, but I'll leave it at that for now. If I could just, Andy, do you mind if I just- Yeah, please, Kim, that? jump in. I was just going to throw to you to see if you want to add to that. So it was 33% felt that organizations should only um, only hire APRs. Uh, interestingly, 33% is about the number of APRs that we have at CPRS. So those of us with APRs are like, yeah, right, give us that advantage. But James Grinig actually kind of dove, dove into that. And you know, they were looking at the fact that for many professionals, APR is seen as a very individual professional tool and not necessarily as a symbol of ethical practice or that kind of designation that demonstrates that. So I think that does call upon uh, associations to really lean into the value of APR, not just as, oh, this will kind of further you along your career, it's nice to have those letters after your name, but that it really is a signal uh, that you, you adhere to that code of professional standards. Yeah, and I've just pasted the, a few links in the chat for people to check out. Uh, the most recent one is the survey that uh, that Kim was just speaking to and Cam mentioned. Uh, there's the, and we'll be changing the name from fake news primer, but uh, there's the uh, piece around misinformation, disinformation, Daniel Tisch's paper on the elevation of public relations, and some links around, you know, what it means to be an APR and why PR matters. So uh, feel free to peruse those at your, at your own leisure. You know, off the top, it just really great introductions. And I think, you know, very quickly, uh, the three of you have established why we invited you here today. The credibility and experience that you bring is, is so important. And I'm, I'm really excited to get to the QA portion a little bit later on. I, I wanted to start with this question for you. And, and really, I, I, I know we've touched on some of this, but, and Kim, maybe I'll start with you, but what resources exist for PR professionals today that can help to establish credibility and trust? So beyond the APR and going through that process, maybe you could talk a little bit on, on what that looks like, but wh what, what other tools are out there? How can we as professionals or students that are, aspiring to be in PR, what can we do today to really professionalize our practice and uh, be ethical leaders in this field? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, you, you've pasted some of them. I, and, you know, this has been a journey for us that, you know, started a long time ago, as you mentioned, the, the white paper uh, that Dan Tish authored in 2017. That was really a response to the emergence. I mean, you know, Sean Spicer stood in front of a podium and kicked, kicked something we were all talking about off in, into full force. And I think, you know, the, the white paper, uh, the ethical PR task force, we really wanted to have this national conversation. And that was when CPRS made the decision to make sure we had ethical PR in our vision, inserting that in our vision, inserting that in our strategic framework. Um, you know, the, the podcast interview series that we shared, that you shared in the link, you know, called PR Matters, which was really uh, interviewing senior professionals about the value of ethical PR. Um, we really tapped into a lot of tools out there. You know, uh, we worked with the Chartered Institute of Public Relations. We adapted their ethics uh, decision tree. You know, one of the things I found, I led a, a pretty big team at, at the AER, and one of the things I found is a lot of people, a lot of younger practitioners, um, didn't really understand the line between bad PR and unethical PR. So, you know, I've made a recommendation. My boss says, no, I want a news release. And it's not something newsworthy. It's not strategic. But is it really, you know, a violation of your profession? So we had this ethical decision tree, which helps you walk through some of those questions. And then we added the element of coaching. So we have a, group, a list of phone numbers there. You can phone a member of the College of Fellows. And they'll walk through the issue with, it, with you and talk through it. The, the, that PR registry, you know, that publicly accessible, searchable database of members where people can go on and look there and look up Kim Blanchett and say, hey, she's there. She has, by virtue of her name in this database, agreed to, per, to practice within that code of professional standards. And that was something that 87% of PR professionals and 83% of Canadians supported. We also really worked about rewarding ethical behavior, you know, and we launched the Heather Pullen Memorial Award for ethical PR uh, to celebrate those who demonstrate the high and ethical practice. And it's not just at a national level. Our local societies are having events and discussions and professional development opportunities really linked into ethics, hinging into ethics. So, you know, we've really seen ethics become something that came up when something unethical happened to being really part of just our regular discourse, part of how we view our, our profession and the conversations we're having every day. Yeah, Cam, maybe as a CPRS national president, I'll throw it to you and then to Fiona next. Well, Kim, uh, Kim covered most of the good tools that we have, but I think, you know, writ large, mem just membership in a professional association is, is a starting point. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm recruiting members and it's membership month next month. <laughs> uh, join IABC. Uh, if you're in New Zealand, join Prince, right? Um, there, there's... There's professional associations around the world. Um, and what they do is they offer you all those things that, that Kim was just describing uh, that can provide you the guidance, the framework that you need. Um, I think from an individual level, it, 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 all, it behooves all of us to, to you know, first of all, conduct ourselves personally uh, in an ethical and, and, and in an ethical manner and with integrity in, in all of our work. Um, as, as organizations, we need to call out unethical actions. Um, so there, there are ways we can do that. People often ask me, um, you know, if, if so, if we, if we find out a, one of your members has done X, what do you do? What can you do? And this is a, this is a whole can of worms I'm about to open, but, um, you know, the question of, is there, uh, you've got to register, but what does that mean? And can you, uh, can you hold people to account for unethical behaviors? Um, currently, no, uh, to be frank. Uh, CPRS doesn't have, we're, we're, not a, uh, we're not a profession in the way that engineers are, that accountants are. We're not a regulated industry. So we don't have the, the regulatory ability to enforce decisions. But we do have tools at our disposal to ensure that, uh, that at least our membership uh, is following the professional code because as a member, you automatically sign on to the Code of Professional Standards. We do have a judi judicial and ethics uh, um, framework through which complaints can be made and decisions can be, can be brought. Um, the, the enforcement piece is, is a whole other discussion, but um, there, there are things within that professional organization that, uh, to, to Kim's points, provide all the guidance that you need, and then on the other end of it, um, provide uh, some of the framework within we, we understand that we need to operate. 
And Fiona, from a, from a maybe a more of a global perspective, uh, any other resources you could suggest or thoughts that you have? My first thought is that if you ever stop learning in this game, then you become irrelevant. So if we go back to what both my colleagues have been saying today, we need to ensure that the advice and the professional services that we give are current. And that currency can actually come about by being a member of your professional institute. So I suppose that's the first point I want. If you stop learning, doesn't matter if you're coming out of university or if you're like me, been around for 25 years, nobody's going to employ you. The second thing you need to think about is from a global perspective, and certainly what I would suggest um, with the Global Alliance, this month is actually ethics month. So around the world, you can pop onto the site, you can actually see what everybody else in the world has been doing. Ethics isn't something separate to our profession, it is what we are. And the minute we start trying to say it's something it's not, and be away from it, it becomes irrelevant. Now here in New Zealand, we don't necessarily have the ability to um, take people to court, but every year, every one of our members, by virtue of the fact that they pay on an annual subscription, part of that is to ensure that they tick the code of ethics. And we in New Zealand have actually put together many ethical cases when they have been brought to our attention and held those members to account. In some cases, that has seen them actually be removed from the, the system, but in other times that we've even been able to work to ends with meet both ours and the client. Do not believe for one moment ethics isn't who we are. That's great. I, I appreciate the insight on that. And I, you know, one of the things that I, you know, as somebody that that has a master's degree but not the APR. I will say, and Kim, in particular, last week when you were presenting on that, that really, that rang true for me, um, the need to dig into that APR and, and really go through that practice as like the reinforcing tool. It's just another step. And it's something I think, just what Fiona was speaking to, it, it's globally recognized and it's, it's what we can do to try and bolster that trust and credibility in our industry. So uh, thanks for each of those uh, thoughts. And Cam, thanks for the plug too. Uh, it's a membership month next month. And if you're a student, discounted rate too, which I'm happy to share more info on later. Um, you know, I guess the, the other question I would I would have, and, and we, you know, I think then we'll uh, look to the chat for, for any of the questions that might come up there. Uh, earlier today, we heard from, you know, Dr. Hodson, uh, Robert Remington, they both spoke to, um, to this piece as well. And one of the questions that came up in both of those chats was, what happens when it's, it's somebody that you're working with that's, that's doing that unethical work. And it might be a journalist, it might be somebody in government, but they're, you know, you're providing your advice, you're providing your framework and strategy, and it's getting ignored. How do you, I guess, navigate that? And could you even cut off that link? Like, what are some of the strategies you would use to deal with that sort of behavior? Cam, maybe I'll put you on the spot as a start. Oh, sure. Put me on the spot first. I was going to say, hand that one to Kim. She's she's already described her uh, very personal situation. Uh, you know, every time I hear that story, I, I it just astounds me every time I hear it. Um, I, I have, frankly and and thankfully, not been in that that difficult situation. I think the first thing I would say is is I would go to what Kim talked about earlier about the ethical decision making tree. So that came out of the work that Kim and, and others in CPRS did on uh, the ethics task force uh, and, and using a model built by CIPR in the UK. Uh, it, it's, it's a really, really helpful tool. And you know, I'm, I'm a relatively senior practitioner. I've been at this uh, PR stuff for, for 20 years. And uh, I, see, I see Tom Ormsby over there laughing. He, he's, <laughs> he, he knows I'm seeing, there you go. Um, the, uh, I, I, still, I still turn to that. In fact, that, when, that, uh, when Kim uh, launched that, what about two years ago, Kim, uh, I've, I've probably used that thing a half a dozen times uh, since it came out uh, on, on a regular basis, just in day-to-day in -day stuff and work. Uh, our, our firm works uh, heavily in the political world and government and public affairs. So I, I hate to say it, but the uh, the win at all cost mentality of the political world is a is an ethical minefield, 
And, uh, and so that sort of, the, that sort of a tool is extremely valuable and, and just walking yourself through so that, so that you can understand for yourself that you're on solid ground, what you, what you know, what you believe and, and what, what you know to be true, what you know to be ethical. And then you have to bring that to the people who are either uh, the decision, decision makers or the people who are conducting, you know, acting unethically and, and speaking to them and framing them in those in those terms. So that's that's kind of where I would say a starting point is for sure. And especially too, as we're in this, you know, hopefully tail end of the pandemic, perhaps, uh, we, where maybe we felt a little bit more isolated, not seeing people face to face that I think that just adds to it, right? It's that knowing that you have that decision tree that you can use and then, you know, the network of fellows as Kim had talked about earlier. Uh, Kim, anything to add to that piece? couple things and I see Elizabeth's uh, question in there so I'll touch on her too you know um, I, I look at crisis management and crisis communications and we always tell people you need a plan you need you, you can't just the time to address your crisis is not in the middle of crisis the time to address whether or not you've been pushed past an ethical line is not in the middle of the conversation you really need to become a student of peer ethics you know read the case studies be involved in these kinds of conversations like I said when I was confronted with this issue I had a network I had people I could talk to I had people I could pick up the phone and go oh my gosh this is happening um, you know ask yourself what would you do if you were asked to lie to a reporter, if you were asked to change a few numbers or hide relevant information that was in the public interest, ask yourself that now. Because if you think it's going to give you a queasy feeling in the pit of your stomach now, just wait until it's happening. I think there are other some things to, that you can do. One thing I, I always did, every organization I went to, go to the law, go to law, go to the legal team. Because the legal team usually sides with comms because they're risk averse. Um, another thing is, is that education well before. Every communication strategy I developed for an internal client, for an internal when I was in-house, I always had as an appendix the, P the CPRS Code of Professional Conduct. This is your communications team, and this is how we work, and this is the code by which we work. We did education. I would share um, articles, or I would send something where another company was, you know, in, in a, an ethical issue and go, hey, just sharing this. Here's why we wouldn't be in this situation. Here's how we do communications at this organization, and here are the professional standards we're guided by. In Argyle, one of our main boardrooms has the code of professional standards on the wall in you know, huge type. So I think it's if you can surround yourself and make that part of the conversation, then it's not you rolling in you know, um, saying, oh my gosh, you're being unethical. And that's really careful too. When, you, when you're with somebody that's in a position of power and authority, it's not you're being unethical or you're asking me to do something unethical. It's I'm sorry, in my profession, here's the code of professional conduct. I'm afraid I can't do that. That violates that code. But there's a risk, and you could be putting your job on the line. You know, the day that I said, no, I cannot lie to a reporter, and by the way, don't ask anybody on my team because they won't either, I, I packed up my stuff. I started putting, you know, awards in my bag because I was the sure. Um, I was going to be shown the door. That didn't happen, um, but uh, but I can tell you, it, it solidified two things. I had to get out of that organization, and my advice was no longer going to be heard. It, it, such a courageous moment, too, right? To 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 be faced with that kind of situation, and I can only imagine how unsettling that was. But again, you come back to what you know and what your APR and CPRS background has taught you, right? So you touched on something too, and, and Fiona, maybe I'll ask you this question as well, a double barreled. So first to comment on the first piece, but what about the evidence-based side of PR in, in terms of how we can support journalists or governments? How can we use evidence to establish our credibility and to help governments and journalists establish theirs? So I'll Oops. I'll answer the first part of the question in terms of being unethical. It's really important wherever you are in your career that you have actually a really good understanding of the code of conduct and what is unethical. Because there's a huge difference between what is unethical and what's immoral. So if we go back to everybody actually has a right to be heard, stand firm on the ground that you know. Now, it's really hard for young practitioners. So right now you're talking to a number of us who have been around probably being bruised and have been able, because we are so senior, to front it. May I suggest to you, if you are young practitioners and you find yourself in a situation like that, 
hold fast, wait till you can go and talk to your manager or to the legal team before you say anything because you do need a little bit more experience to navigate what could be potentially a job ending situation. Now, again, you've heard from Kim, I've done it too. We're quite happy to stand up, but we are a little bit further along. I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question, um, Andy? Yeah, Fiona, just wondering, like, in terms of what, what pieces of evidence, and I think you pointed to a few things, you know, in terms of go talk to your manager, um, you know, rely on your code of conduct, understanding to like some of the, the some of the discussion points need to have, but what kind, how do we approach this from an evidence based standpoint, how can we use data or evidence to help support the work that we're doing and being ethical and, and credible. One of the things that we all learn when we're becoming communications professionals is the, um, the importance of research. So whether that be research in the classroom, research in a company, research provides evidence and data. So I currently work in an organization that, that is, has children at its heart. And as you can probably appreciate, what people want to know is how many children may or may not have been harmed. So you actually have to know the business of the business and you need to be able to reach out to it and bring together that data and turn it into information and make it readily available. Now, I know that you think that if you are somewhere on your educational journey, it will stop, it will never stop. Evidence will always ensure it backs up what you're doing as professionals. Thanks for that. Serbi, do we have any questions in the chat that have not been answered? I'm just taking a quick look here. Elizabeth, did, uh, did Kim's answer uh, cover your question? I think most of the questions has been answered. Um, I remember Ali Abel mentioned that, uh, mentioned, commented uh, that I find that many people doing the hiring don't know what an APR or designations from other PR organization is and what are the benefits are. There is an education piece required to explain the importance to non-PR managers. Do you have any comments or any anything on this? Maybe I'll maybe I'll start and then hopefully this spurs something. I'm, I feel very fortunate to have joined an organization. Um, I'm working with WorkSafe BC right now, and you know they're an organization that really fosters that professionalization and making sure that we're able to take part in events like this. So I think the first piece is as you're seeking jobs and roles, trying to trying to find a place where they'll align with that and having a seat at the table and being able to explain why it's important for you to take part in these sort of things, not only to build your network and, and be a lifelong learner, but I think also it's about knowing where you can go for resources when you get stuck and having, you know, having a website you can go to, um, the, the list of fellows, those sorts of things. So I think that's part of it on the proactive side, but I'd be curious, um, Kim, Fiona, or Cam, if you have thoughts more on the ongoing education piece and how you can sort of foster that within your organization. Yeah, like I said, I think, you know, we, you know, we used to have a, 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 a weekly thing in our organization, we called someone else's problem, and we would kind of dissect something in the media and how would we have addressed it. But I think the point to um, talk about like HR managers, hiring uh, team members, not knowing what an what an APR is, um, you know, one of the things that I used to do is explain it in my cover letter, right? I'm an APR, this is what it means and, you know, provide a, a, a link. So uh, I am seeing more jobs, you know, talk about APR as being preferred or a designation as being preferred and that's that's a foot in the door. You know, I know that's something that uh, we've, we've tried to do uh, at CPRS is provide that education uh, and really through our social media talk about that, that APR. I think um, also use the research, you know, the fact that we, Canadians trust an APR uh, because they see that as you know a CPA designation for accounting or a PN or something that demonstrates that they're that this is a profession and this is a profession that's held to uh, a certain code of conduct. Um, so I think you know they're even if in your own um, you know in your own uh, job seeking or whatever you're doing you can do that. And one thing we did with our HR whenever I was hiring, I would sit down with our HR staff and say, I'm looking for people that you know, my preference is APR, here's what it is. And here's how it relates to your own profession. You know, you, you want a CHPR designation when you hire a human resources professional, I'm looking for that same kind of, uh, of designation. So there's there is a lot you can do internally that that PR for PR um, work in your own organization. 
and it explaining it's not doesn't necessarily look like what you see on TV necessarily in the communications world, right? <laughs> uh, Fiona, any thoughts on that question? We obviously have some issues with that here in New Zealand. So if we actually look what is the intent of APR, it's to make you a better professional. And what we are also, uh, over time, what we've actually found in the last few years here in New Zealand, we've actually had a lot more seniors deciding that they needed to do it. So APR is actually a way to a means to continue professional development and putting your stick in your sand and saying, these are the things we have. In New Zealand, we continue on that journey, um, not too dissimilar to our Canadian and friends but for you the professional it makes you a heck of a lot better and it provides for you an ongoing framework which needs to be part of your business of professional development i'd just like to pick up that getting my apr absolutely changed how i practiced the profession i became it was night and day i became a very different i became more confident but i became much less, you know, intuitive and, you know, this is what I think. And I really started backing everything with the research, making sure I had metrics. It really, um, you know, the fact that I got, you know, better jobs and it wasn't just because I had letters after my name is because those letters really led me to practice in a different way. Yeah, if I can just jump in uh, really quickly, sorry, but one of the things we have found in New Zealand is that all of our APR candidates every year, usually within a year, have got a better role. Uh, sorry, I was, uh, Elizabeth had another, let's take another question. Have a CPRS rep speak at a meeting of HR professionals. Great idea. Uh, <clears throat> one of many that gets discussed, we have, a, we have a, an advocacy and ethical PR uh, committee within CPRS and and that's actually one of the ideas that we've talked about is how do we get the APR designation better known uh, it, you know I, I'll tip my hat to Kim um, because you know Kim and I have known each other for for 10 plus years uh, she was working with I think you were at AER uh, when we met and um, you were the first person I had ever met who actually as a leader in an organization um, was driving the APR within your organization and making, not just saying we need to hire, but I, I remember having a conversation with you and you talking about making the APR program an, an option, a professional development option for all of your employees. And I think that that's a really critical component is, you know, we're drinking the Kool-Aid here, the, the, the four of us, um, but for our organizations to really transform and see that value, one big major piece is to have the leaders in the organization actually driving it like Kim did at AER. And I'm assuming that at, like you are at, at Argyle. Yeah. And, and to Fiona's point, most of them then left me because they got better jobs, but it was better for the profession, right? Once, once you have your APR, you know, it's, uh, it was just such a, it was just so rewarding to see them all grow in their roles um, in, in, in changing that. You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, I got my APR. I, I, I was an independent consultant for 15 plus years before I joined this firm. Um, I got my APR because I, I, same reason as Kim, I didn't have that formal background. I wanted to find out if I was doing it right. Um, and, and for me, it also transformed my career. Um, not because it, it got me better jobs. Um, I don't think anyone's ever hired me because I had an APR, I'll be honest. Uh, but um, when, I, when I put it behind my name, which I do uh, in, in every proposal and on the website, people ask me, what is that? And it's, a, it's an opportunity to tell people about it and start to build that conversation. And, the, and sometimes the way I describe it is, you know, you're, you're building a retaining wall in your backyard. Uh, some guy comes along and says, hey, I can build that wall for you. Uh, some other guy comes along and says, I'm a professional engineer and I can build that wall and it's actually going to stay up. Um, you know, there's a bit of a difference between those two people. And, you know, which guy would you want building your retaining wall? Well, it's, it's, it's not, a, not dissimilar here. Question that came up in the chat from Anna Mullins. With information flowing at a substantially faster rate than ethics appear to be, what, what can organizations do or what are they doing to speed up the dissem dissemination of ethics training and certification within those organizations? How can we influence that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it does, it is 
speed can be counterintuitive, but I think having a, both a combination of those really quick tools, like we, we talked about the decision tree and other tools where you can access something for that, you know, immediate need, but those deeper conversations, right? Those deeper, deeper studies, case studies. Um, I know, uh, you know, there's, you know, the I, Institute of PR, CIPR, um, that some of the papers that go out are really, really good. There's just so many good resources out there um, to to better educate yourself. Um, and I think it's really, you know, even in, in different fields, you know, I was, um, when we were preparing for this, I was re, kind of re-reviewing Duncan Corber's book about crisis communications. And he speaks to, you know, the un, how unethical it is to focus on regaining power or, or uh, focus on reputation, you know, or brand in the middle of a crisis, what your duty is as a communicator in the middle of a crisis. So, you know, there are so many examples of where we can, you know, educate ourselves, have conversations, share that information. Um, and we've talked about, you know, ethics as part of APR and, you know, do we offer a course, a mandatory course as part of the APR program where, you know, where you do have to take a module on, on ethics before you can write the test. I'd go as far to say it starts with us all who have already been through the process. So wherever we are in our profession, so, you know, as you know, a number of us are really senior. I have a team, um, a, a considerably big team at the moment, and it's actually part of our professional development. So wherever you are on your journey, we need to take some ownership as a profession for ensuring that we act ethically and those around us actually know about our code of ethics. I love that approach of building it into a framework, working with strat HR, working within your, you know, executive leadership teams or management teams to build that in. I think that's great. And I know there's discussions happening too with post sex across Canada, and I'm sure in different jurisdictions on how we can make it work too to, to partner with, uh, you know, higher education facilities to really drive that home. So I think the collaborative approach really seems to be a a nice approach. And I know, you know, as a member of the CPRS Vancouver Island Board, uh, we have a really good relationship with Royal Roads and that, you know, this conference is a great example of how we do that ongoing learning. I'm going to go to the last question. I know we're coming up to time here and maybe it's the million dollar question from Melanie Kilpatrick. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to build trust between, um, you know, us as the PR communications professionals and the journalists and, and, and media folks that we work with uh, as part of this, you know, framework? How about I start from a New Zealand perspective, yeah, oh, okay. um, which may be a little bit different. So I don't think there's actually a trust issue because at the end of the day, it's about relationships. So, the, so it doesn't matter if we're talking to a member of the media or we are doing stakeholder engagement with a community group or we're talking to our chief executive. Build a bridge before you need it, before you need to cross over it. So if your area of expertise, and again, Canada is so much bigger than New Zealand, um, is finance, then, you know, who are the financial journalists you need to know and why and why should they? Now, of course, you know, you just can't go and have a cup of tea anymore, but the world has opened up a lot easier with social media um, and platforms where you can. So my thing is, it's all around relationships. Who says there isn't trust? That's often a perception, uh, certainly here in New Zealand. Anytime uh, we need to deal with journalists, um, we do. But remember, they have a story and you have a job to do. Yeah, well, you can go for tea much easier than we can, Fiona, because you've had your borders closed. <laughs> um, so I, I, I started my, my remarks uh, by saying I, I was a journalist, and uh, so I had that natural cynicism. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure I agree 100%, Fiona, with you uh, that there's not a lack of trust. Um, I absolutely agree with you that the relationships are at the root of, of bridging. Um, all journalists, uh, including some of my good friends, have a natural cynicism towards people like me, even towards me personally, um, and, until you have those conversations. So there is always going to be that cynicism uh, and to a certain extent, a lack of trust. I, I, was, uh, I was reviewing the Edelman Trust Barometer uh, before this. And um, I think, so three, three of the things that really stuck out for me there, and these go to the relationship between us and any of our stakeholders, whether it be media or anyone else, proximity is a key indicator of trust. So in other words, 
close personal relationships. People will believe you and they will trust you if you know them and they know you. The closer you are to them, uh, the higher the level of trust. Clear, consistent, fact-based, high quality information. So consistent, ongoing, good information. Uh, and then looking at things from a, through a solution focused lens. So rather than trying to depict things in a, in a divided way or in an us versus them way, uh, working with any of your stakeholders from a solution focused perspective is gonna be one way to help build that trust. Um, I'm, I'm gonna hop in just on a, a point I made um, uh, on Trust and PR and I'll talk a bit about a journalist, but I struggle with trust. I, you know, I, it's the holy grail. It, it, it's, you know, how do you feel when someone says, trust me, or I'm looking for your trust? You know, I feel like trust is like happiness. It's an outcome, right? You, the more you pursue it, the more elusive it's going to be. Um, and that organizations should be seeking confidence and credibility, right? Do, do the right thing. Do what you say you're going to do. Do my audiences and customers have confidence? I'll keep my word, live up to my brand, be honest and ethical. If I can get that, I might get to trust. And that's not just PR. I mean, you can't communicate your way out of unethic, unethical behavior or bad situation. One, when, when it comes to me, the media, before the rails went off of the AER, I worked with Amy Thurlow at Mount St. Vincent University, and we actually brought this um, paper to the World PR Forum in Madrid, and it was a paper on organizational factors. Could you actually rank excellence in your PR shop? Really exciting, and, and Amy's brilliant. She, she actually put together um, a, a survey that allowed us to do that, and one of our stakeholder groups was the media, the journalists that we dealt with at the AER. And the responses we got back from them were the responses that we really, really wanted. We know we are often on opposite side issues, but they said we were responsive. We were respectful. We were honest when we told them we couldn't share with something. That they didn't feel spun by us. They really felt that, you know, yes, we had a message to deliver, but we were, you know, that there was an interaction and there was a relationship there. And I think, you know, I've worked in some pretty hairy files. I've worked on some crises. I've worked on some some stuff that that's really put me in a difficult position with journalists, but I've never really felt that that journalist didn't trust me personally. They might roll their eyes at the minister I'm working for. They might roll their eyes at the, you know, at the slogan on the wall of the organization. But when it came down to somebody calling and just saying, hey, Cam, I'm looking for this and me saying, I'm sorry, I can't give you that. It, you know, it was based on that relationship and credibility, but it was also because I had a reputation for being, you know, somebody who, did what I said I was going to do is somebody who dealt honestly. And so that's, you know, I had a colleague that once said, the first rule of PR is your own. And if you can't establish yourself as an ethical, honest um, representative for your organization, then that's going to be really, really difficult in all your relationships with your stakeholders, internally with employees and with journalists. And uh, and that's why it's, it's just so important and just really applaud Royal Roads for this conference and, and for this conversation. And what an excellent transition, Kim. I know we're coming up to time, but I just, on, on behalf of everyone else, I want to say thanks. I feel like I could sit here and listen to the three of you for hours and hours, but uh, I think I'll throw it back to Serbi and, uh, and, and go from there. But thanks again for joining. I'd like to present a very warm welcome, very warm gratitude towards all our panelists because it was such an enriching and enlightening uh, discussion for all of us. And I'd like to thank our audience as well for being such a patient audience. Um, I would also like to thank for sharing all the resources and references. It's going to be really helpful for us in future. It was wonderful to get to know about the importance of APR and how the ethical framework and professional association can help to fight against misinformation and disinformation. So now I will uh, turn over to Dr. Yasir Abdul Rahim, who is an assistant professor at the School of Communication and Culture for the closing remarks. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Sruvi uh, Sharma. And uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Andy Watson, uh, and the panel moderator, and the other, our other three panelists, uh, Fiona Cassidy, uh, Kim Blanchett, and Kim McBlyne. Uh, that was very interesting panel discussion, uh, which the audience and I enjoyed that. I wish I, uh, there was more time to listen, to listen more to how build the trust and uh, uh, trusting and ethical PR and uh, learn more about uh, your, um, your professional uh, experiences. Um, uh, uh, as we 
we had to come to the end of this um, session, unfortunately, which is, was very interesting. Uh, we came to the end of day one of uh, communication um, ethics conference, uh, communication ethics 2022 conference. Uh, I want to remind everyone that our second day uh, tomorrow will include six sessions. Uh, we will start at nine uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. with a very uh, exciting topic entitled uh, The Toxic Democracy Lessons from the Sam Bot Project, which I'm curious to know about. Um, and um, I hope you don't uh, miss it. Uh, we will have three panel discussions after. Uh, with several panelists, um, I don't. Uh, uh, I'm afraid to uh, to miss any of them. Um, at ten o'clock, uh, between ten o'clock and ten o'clock a.m. and three p.m., uh, we will have um, sessions discussing the process of turning research into narrative films, uh, communicating environment ethics to make different to make a difference, indigenizing uh, professional communication and um, uh, engagement or abandonment of women in Afghanistan. Uh, our closing session will be uh, at 3 p.m., um, which will be a talk about uh, teaching the unthinkable, the Holocaust and children literature. Again, it's a very uh, interesting topic and I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to listening to it. Um, thank you very much.